Very Old Engines by the Reverend W. Audrey. Dear friends, one hundred years ago, when Scarloe and Reneus first arrived on their railway, they were young and silly. Scarloe was sulky and bouncy. He and Reneus quarreled, but they learned sense, and the owner has just given them a lovely hundredth birthday. Talilin and Dolgoch at Towin are one hundred too. How about going to wish them many happy returns? The author. Crosspatch. Scarloe made a face. Not again, Nancy. Please. Just a teensy polish, she coaxed. You must look nice for your 100th birthday. I am nice. You're just a fusspot. And you're a horrid old crosspatch. Nancy polished him vigorously. Scarloe smiled. Nancy, he said. I really was a crosspatch once. Shall I tell you? Yes, please. Well, come down. I can't tell it properly while you're fussing up there. Just five minutes, then. No longer. Nancy sat down on a box, and the old engine began. Talilchen, Dolgoch, Reneas, and I were built together in England. Who? asked Nancy. Are Talilchen and Dolgoch? Talishlan is my twin. Dolgoch is Reneas's. Their railway is at Toin in Wales, and they're 102. They were green and we were red. Talishlan and I had four wheels then, and no cab. We thought we were wonderful, and talked about how splendid we'd look pulling coaches. What about trucks? asked Nancy. Scarloe chuckled. We had no use for them, he said. I was finished first, and sent away on a ship. I didn't like that. It wobbled dreadfully. At the port, the big railway kept me waiting. They had no cranes to lift me out. It wasn't the fat controller's railway then. He would have managed much better. What did they do? asked Nancy. They used the ship's derricks. They nearly turned me upside down, said Scarloe indignantly, and left me hanging while they arranged the dock. You must have looked funny, gurgled Nancy. Yes, and I felt it too. I got crosser and crosser. They fastened me to the truck at last, and an engine took me away. His name was Neil. He was ugly but kind, and we were soon friends. So you're bound for the wee railway, he said. You must put some order into those trucks. The average they make you hardly believe. I didn't like the sound of that. But I was too tired to say anything. Plenty of people were waiting when we got there, but they weren't used to engines, and it was dark before I was on my rails. Then they left me, lonely and unhappy, and wishing Reneas would come. Trucks were everywhere next morning. Suddenly, with a rattle and a roar, a train of loaded ones came in. I was surprised. There's no engine, I said. A workman laughed. They've come down by gravity, he said. The empty ones need pulling up, though. That's why you've come. But can't they go up by gra or whatever it was you said? Gravity only brings things down. We need horses or engines like you to pull them up. What? I have to pull trucks? Of course. I won't. I want coaches. He just laughed and walked away. Soon Mr. Mark, the manager, arrived with some men. He showed them my parts from a book. We are going to steam you, Scarloe, he said. Can I pull coaches, sir? No, certainly not. I gave him such a look. They didn't understand engines, so it was easy. My fire wouldn't burn, and I made no steam. I just blew smoke at them. They called me bad names, but I didn't care. Next day they tried again, and the next, and the next. I just gave them my look and wouldn't do a thing. At last the manager said, Very well, be a crosspatch, but we're not going to look at your sulky face all day. We'll cover you up and leave you till you're a better engine. They did too, chuckled Scarloe. They fetched a big tarpaulin, 
and covered me right up. I didn't like that at all. I think it served you right, said Nancy severely. Never mind her, Scarloey. Please tell us what happened next. Nancy looked in surprise. A group of people had quietly come up to listen while Scarloey was telling her his story. Bucking Bronco I was lonely and miserable, Scarloey continued, till at last the manager came. I hope now that you're a better engine. Yes, sir, please, sir. Because I've asked Mr. Bobby to come and look after you. Mr. Bobby had helped to build me in England. I liked him, so we soon had steam up. Come on, Scarloey, he said. We must help the workmen finish the line before the inspector comes. I didn't mind pulling trucks with Mr. Bobby, and we worked so hard that by the time Reneas arrived, the line was ready. Reneas never got so excited and bouncy as I did. He walked without hurry or fuss. Trucks often played tricks on me to make me cross, but they soon found that teasing Reneas was a mistake. He was shunting one day when I came alongside. I was excited. I am pulling the director's train, I said, and taking the inspector tomorrow. Think of that, Reneas pondered. You mind your box and bounces then, Scarloey, he said at last. The directors won't like them. Pooh, I snorted and bounced away to fetch the coaches. Peep, peep, I whistled. Hello, girls. Who is it? Agnes's deep voice echoed from the back of the shed. It's an engine, whispered Beatrice the guard's van. He's come to take us out. Beware of strange engines, warned Agnes. We must be on our guard. Our guard has just come, giggled Beatrice. Jemima and Ruth, the other coaches, sighed with relief. I pulled them all happily to the station. Agnes, still suspicious, kept muttering. Be on your guard! Be on your guard! But I was too excited to listen. It might have been better if I had. I was seasoning with excitement as I ran around and back down on Agnes. It's fun, it's fun, I chortled. You may look harmless, she whispered, but we'll watch you, we'll watch you. She took me quite aback, but even Agnes couldn't complain about our upward journey. We stopped at every station, and the directors got out to admire the arrangements. Everything went well. I forgot about Agnes, and the manager, smiling, joined us on the footplate for the journey home. It looks so easy, Mr. Bobby, he said as we rolled gently down. Can I drive him, please? We were running nicely. First rate, first rate, I hissed happily gaining speed, and all unknowing I began to bounce. The manager, alarmed, closed my regulator, too quickly and too much. Agnes' buffers crashed. He's playing tricks! Bump him, girls! Bump him! They surged against me, urging me on. I bounced and lurched. I couldn't help it. The manager lost his footing, grabbed wildly for a handhold, and disappeared. Peep, peep, peep! Brakes guard, please! Mr. Bobby seized my controls, stopped the train, and looked back. Two legs waved wildly from a bush. The manager was unhurt, but very cross. I'll not ride that bucking bronco again, he said. He sat in Beatrice for the rest of the journey. The directors complained they'd been badly shaken. They said it was my fault. Reneas will take the inspector tomorrow, they ordered. You will stay out of sight in the shed. But late that evening, the manager came. I'm sorry, sir. I did try to be good. It wasn't your fault, Scarlouis. I'm sorry I was cross. We must do what the directors say now, but I'll make it up to you later. The inspector was pleased with Reneas. You've done very well, he said kindly, for a new engine. He told the directors about some improvements which were needed. But, he went on, on the whole, your arrangements are good. He came to see me, and the directors told him what they thought had happened. I think, gentlemen, he said, that you are mistaken. Scarloy should prove to be a useful engine, but what he needs is another pair of wheels. Take my advice, 
and have them fitted. Then you'll see the difference. Good day. Stick in the mud. The manager was as good as his word, Scarloway continued. I came home from the works with six wheels and a cab. A cab is the latest thing for engines, he told me. I hope it will cheer you up after your disappointment. Reneas chuckled. It cheered him too much, and those silly coaches made him worse. Such a handsome engine, they tittered. Six wheels and a cab, so distinguished, my dears. It's a pleasure to see him. He soon got too big for his wheels. Scarloe smiled ruefully. I did too, he said. Go on, Reneas. He boasted about his cab till I was tired, said Reneas. You should get one like me and be up to date, he would say. No, thank you. You look like a snail with that house on your back. You don't go much faster either. Slow am I, let me tell you. Who was late three times last week? Oh, it's no use talking. You're just an old stick in the mud. He called me more names and we quarreled. We ended up back to back, not speaking. It went on for days and days. One dark Saturday morning, Scarloe had to take the workmen's train to the quarry. It had rained for three days. You always pick on me for wet days, he complained. You, said Mr. Bobby, have got a cab to keep us dry. Come on. Scarloe slept and snorted on the damp rails. He began to wonder if caps were worth it. An hour later I was warming up when Scarloe's guard came coasting down in an empty truck. He stopped by our shed. There's a landslide beyond the tunnel, he said. Scarloe's run into it. He's stuck. Show a wee, Reneas. Look lovely. I'm sorry, Mr. Peter, sir, but that Scarloe is too swanky. He says I'm a stick in the mud. He can jolly well stick in the mud himself. It serves him right. But, went on my driver, there's poor Mr. Bobby and the quarrymen. Does it serve them right too? The guard says mud's like treacle. Oh dear, I said, that will never do. We must save them before they get stuck in. And off we puffed with two trucks and some workmen. Things weren't so bad after all. The men had partly cleared the line and had levered Scarloe back. He was hissing and grumbling dreadfully, but we didn't listen to him. We cleared the rest of the line and I pushed Scarloe out of the way before taking the quarrymen to work. Mr. Bobby had cleaned and oiled his wheels and motion so that when I returned with the coaches, I could help him back to the shed. I'm sorry I was swanky, he said at last. Thank you for helping me. Not at all, I said, but I was still cross. Then Scarloe began to laugh. I'm the stick in the mud after all. He gurgled helplessly. Not you. I laughed too. I couldn't help it. He looked so funny. We were laughing when the cleaners came. We were still laughing when they left. Poor engines, they said, tapping their foreheads. But we weren't mad. We'd learned sense and we've been firm friends ever since. It was nearly dark. The listeners stirred and stretched. Thank you, Scarloe and Reneas, they said. Now you've told us about the old days, we can give you both a splendid birthday next week. Ducks and Dukes But oi keep telling you, said Duck, there are no dukes. They were fine and stately, but they've all been scrapped. Peter Sam goggled in horror. This is dreadful, he wailed. The thing controller said the owner said the Duke said he was coming to our centenary to open our extension around the lake, and now he's scrapped and Scarlowe's and Renee's birthday will be spoiled. Oh dear, oh dear. He bustled away with his empty coaches to tell his bad news. I think, said Scarlowe, that Duck was pulling your wheels. No, Scarloe, he was quite serious. He always jokes like that, chuckled Scarloe, but no one agreed, and they argued so loudly that the thin controller came to stop their noise. They told him about Duck, but he paid no attention. I've no time for this nonsense now, he snapped. There's a change in tomorrow's work. Scarloe, you will meet the Duke at 11 o'clock instead of 10.30. And he hurried away. If there is a duke, 
said Duncan, but they were all too tired to argue any more. They spent a gloomy night, but cheered up next morning when the cleaners greeted the birthday engines with an all-metal band. Drivers and firemen joined in, and even the thin controller banged a metal plate as loudly as anyone. The engines punctuated the music with their whistles. The owner laughed and held his ears. Presently, he looked at his watch. That's enough, he ordered. So Rusty, Sir Handel, and Duncan went at once to fetch their coaches. Visitors crowded the big station. They wanted to go to places along the line to watch the celebrations. Peter, Sam, and Reneas had carefully practiced their parts. Passengers in Agnes, Ruth, Lucy, Jemima, and Beatrice all wore clothes of 1865. Reneas had to pull them behind Peter Sam's television train, not too close and not too far away, so that the cameramen could take their pictures. Visitors waved as they went by, and at last they reached the special sidings near the extension, where they settled down to wait. Listen, said Peter Sam at last, here's Scarlowy, they're cheering him. Good answered Reneas. Perhaps that will make up for his disappointment over the Duke. Scarloe wasn't disappointed at all. I've brought the Duke! I've brought the Duke! I've brought the Duke! I've brought the Duke! He puffed, and triumphantly came to a stand between the two trains. A distinguished-looking man stepped out, climbed to Scarloe's footplate, and drove him on the new line round the lake and back again. Then, standing on Scarloe's front buffer beam, he said, Ladies, gentlemen, and engines, I have pleasure in declaring your lovely lakeside loop line now open. Peter Sam could bear it no longer. Excuse me, Sir Duke, he burst out. Are you real? There was shocked silence. The Duke smiled. Scarloe said you'd been listening to Duck, he answered. Duck thinks Dukes were great western engines, but Dukes are really people. I am happy to assure you, Peter Sam, that I am a real, live duke. I'll give duck dukes, muttered Peter Sam, but he was sternly hushed. The duke turned to the owner. I congratulate you, sir, on your remarkable railway. It must be a record indeed to have two locomotives in regular service, and both a hundred years old. Long life, then, and good running. To Scarloe and Reneas, your famous old engines. The cheering and clapping died away. Speech! shouted someone, and the cry was taken up. Go on, Reneas, whispered the owner. So, rather nervously, the old engine began. Thank you, your grace and everyone, for your kind wishes. You have given us both a lovely 100th birthday, but your grace... Scarloy and I aren't the only record engines. We've got twin brothers. Talithlin and Dolgoch were built at the same time as us, so they are 100 too. And they're still at work. Their railways are towing in Wales. Please go and see them, Your Grace, and everybody, and wish them many happy returns from Scarloy and Reneas, their little old twins. <laughs>